This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. And we're back. Welcome in, everybody, to another episode of the One Royal Way podcast. Jordan Foot here, Josh Kaiser, and Joel Penfield, my good pals, as always. And we have a very special guest today. Um, by the way, I should be a good uh, ad reader here and say thank you to Kansas City Strength and Conditioning, the premier Kansas City baseball development resource. We are always grateful um, for their support of the show. This guy doesn't need an introduction. I'm going to give him one anyway. Um, Play-by-play broadcaster for the Royals has had experience being the voice of the Omaha Storm Chasers. He's done everything under the sun, it seems. Jake Eisenberg joining us today. Jake, how's it going, man? Hey, it's going really well. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be another another person with a name that starts with the letter J. Uh, in the space <laughs> with you guys. Incredible. We've, we've it's checked just about every J name box in the cat. So I think kudos, <laughs> kudos to our parents. Yep. Yes, absolutely, man. We are super excited to have you on. You have just a multitude of experiences. Um, obviously, one specific or two specific that our audience is definitely interested in. Um, you've been around the block, man. Like I, I'm not gonna lie, I was on the LinkedIn page doing a little bit of homework. No big deal. I was like, this guy, man, because Jake, you're not 30 yet, are you? No, what, 20, 29. Um, I'll be, I'll be 29 in March, so we can, we can celebrate in surprise. There you go. Yeah, I was like, man, this guy has done so much stuff. Um, but obviously, we'll jump right in here. It's off season time. You have a lot of personal stuff going on. A lot of big life events happening and, and celebratory reasons. Um, how do you maximize an off season? Like, I know you like to focus on the storytelling aspect. Do you do more research on other teams? Do you self scout? Kind of, what's your your go to plan during a, a big league off season? Honestly, I wish there was one that existed. That the truth is, this is the first big league off season sure. that I've really experienced. You know, twenty twenty two, I was coming off the second season with the Storm Chasers and also filling in with the Mets, but that was also when joining the Royals became a thing that that happened in November of 2022. So I don't know that that was that was an off season that was in a bit of flux just because, OK, now I'm now I'm moving. Let's figure out where I'm moving and when I'm moving and then, you know, do the actual moving. And so this off season is really the first true, you know, big league off season. Um, but at the same time, you know, like you alluded to uh, a lot of personal stuff, I'm getting married uh, a week from Saturday. So that has taken up, you know, the majority of what we've been doing throughout the off season. And um, that's obviously been the focus. And there've been some games that I've called here and there uh, just to, you know, keep the the pipes loose, I guess, so to speak. But um, as far as a plan, I mean, yeah, I, I, I'd like to stay on top of everything that, that's going on and maybe create some notes on the side or, or kind of organize the files that I have. You know, there's a, a running list of notes uh, on my phone. Like I'll take, I'll take some notes on my phone during, um, various press conferences or during interviews or, you know, after I talk to a guy in the clubhouse, you know, I'll go find a, a spot and kind of just like download from my brain into that space. And so there's just this running list of notes that, you know, I'll try and organize in a certain way. Um, I've got to kind of redesign my scorecard a little bit because I, I tweak it in, in just a few different ways, seemingly every off season with things that I noticed that I like, things that I noticed that I didn't like. Uh, I actually picked those up a couple days ago, so I'm really excited. Nice. I'll, I'll, I'll I'll reveal those when the time is right. Yeah, but things things like that, just kind of staying on top of it, staying plugged in, um, having conversations with, with you guys, um, and more or less also just enjoying you know quality time with my fiance, soon to be wife, and and other members of my family and other friends and, and things like that that you don't get to do as much during the during the baseball season. So you basically, so this is your first full year in the show. You got to take some, you know, some of the big league road trips. Did you have a favorite away city? And then to the second part of this question, what was your favorite best away? Who had the best away booth set up? Ooh, uh, I don't know that there's a there's a best. There's a there's definitely a top five ish in my head that you can put in kind of any specific order uh, of places that I've been to. And there are only there are three ballparks that I have yet to call a game in at this point. Um haven't been to Toronto yet, haven't been to Pittsburgh, and I haven't been to D.C. to call a game. Um, I've been to D.C. as a fan. Um, my, the top five that kind of that kind of floats around my head, I love San Francisco. I love Oracle Park. That's such a cool place to call a game with, you know, the brick wall that's 24 feet high in honor of Willie Mays, and you've got the bay, and you've got the Coke bottles, and you've got the big glove out in left field. It's just like one of the iconic vistas, I think, in baseball. 
Um, and then staying in California, San Diego is awesome. They've done such a great job with Petco Park uh, and the surrounding area. The food options there are top notch um, and the weather is is tremendous too. So San Diego always sticks out as one that I really enjoy. Um, having gone to the University of Maryland, uh, Camden Yards was not too, too far. Um, and that's just a jewel of a ballpark in the ways that everybody talks about, you know, um, with the warehouse out in right field and uh, now they've got the bird bat and all these things going on. That's just like a cool place um, to call a game. And staying in the division, um, I, you know, I'll give you I'll give you two more. One of them is a, they're, they're sort of a bonus. I love Seattle. Seattle was phenomenal. Now, we were there in August when it was really warm and the roof was open. Uh, and so we had perfect weather and that definitely plays into it. I'm not really sure if I would have felt the same way if it was rainy and the roof were closed. I don't know, but I happen to get it at like the perfect time. They sold out all three games. Uh, Seattle's definitely somewhere in that top five. And then uh, within the central, Target Field is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, I really, really enjoy going to Target Field. And sneakily, I think I think Comerica Park in Detroit is also pretty underrated. I think that's an underrated ballpark. Um, when the weather's nice there, and yeah, that's a big if because it's Detroit and has the same Midwestern weather issues as Minneapolis or Kansas City or Chicago or Cleveland. Uh, but when the weather's nice there, um, the booth is in a great location. Um, it fills up really nicely when when fans come out. Uh, they do a great job capturing the history of their organization. I think that's a that's a sneaky good ballpark uh, in baseball that doesn't get as much credit as it deserves. Um, as far as a booth setup, um, I mean that kind of goes hand in hand with some of the ballparks that I enjoy calling games at. Um, Target Field, I think, is is really excellent. But I mean, the key to having a good booth setup in my opinion is that you've got a nice spacious desk area uh that usually doesn't have I mean, we're getting into the like some niche like gritty <laughs> things there let me let me put it to you this way and, and this is this is where I'll, I'll stop rambling about this but like there are different types of windows across major league baseball there are certain windows that open up like like an accordion and they go off to one side there are certain windows that open like that there are certain windows that open out. There are certain windows that open up. And depending on the type of window you have, that to me is a big factor of what kind of what the, what the booth atmosphere is like. Like, um, for example, the windows at Kauffman Stadium, they open kind of like an accordion and they go off to the side. So they're just to my left um, when Denny is just to my right. And that's that's great. We have a perfectly open area. There's nothing in our way. It's similar in Milwaukee. Um, there are some places um, like, like Baltimore, for instance, where those windows open in the same way, but then they open and they take up some of the space on the table that's in front of you. So you wind up with a smaller space. Um, anyway, that's enough about windows. Big window guy. <laughs> yeah. Big window. Yeah, there you go. Title of the podcast, Jake Eisenberg. Lots of opinions about windows. <laughs> Big window, yeah. Yeah. Um, talking about the there... windows of competition. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Um, is there anything, cause you've broadcasted a lot of different sports. Like you've said, the baseball wasn't always like that first thing. Is there anything you pull from calling other sports, other games that you can implement into baseball? Or do you think it's really just one isolated thing? Is there any, I don't know, verbiage or style or thing you've picked up along the way that you think comes in handy when you're calling a baseball game? Well, I think it's sport to sport. I mean, all the sports are, are really different from just a broadcast perspective. And then the mediums are different, whether it's radio or TV. Um, and I think it's important that the languages of the sports are different mm -hmm. too. Um, you know, like it's a volleyball match and a baseball game, you know, that sort of things like that. So I wouldn't say that there's a ton that I take from calling other sports to baseball or vice versa, but I think that there's a lot of fundamental broadcast things um, you know, some techniques and fundamental skills there that I think apply across all sports. You know, if you want to lift up the hood for a second, like I really focus on staying uh, in active voice and speaking mm -hmm. in the present tense uh, across all the things that I do across all the sports that I do, because that's the way we as humans most easily digest language. And so when we speak actively and when we stay in present tense, that's an easy way or an easier way for the listener to understand what we're saying. And subconsciously, it just makes it, in my opinion, more pleasing to listen to, as opposed to speaking backwards or speaking in past tense or future tense. Makes total sense. Yeah. 
So Lurk, I'm going to scratch a little bit of history here. What is your personal Mount Rushmore broadcasters? <laughs> yeah, I, you can only pick four. We're not doing uh, that. Things we're going just straight four. We're just throwing you all over the place. Broadcast yeah, but so unfair. Um, well, okay, 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 okay. Vince Scully is on there. Uh, Vince Scully is on the Mount Rushmore of, of broadcasters. Um, I am assuming that this can be anybody across any sport. Yeah. And it's absolutely. Uh, Vince Scully's on there. Um, Kevin Harlan is on there. Um, uh, Ian Eagle is on there. Mm. And this is where it gets so unfair. Yep. Now you got to make a cut. This is where it gets so unfair because now you're going to make me leave somebody out that I don't want to leave out. Um, okay, okay. Here's. I'm I'm gonna break this down for a second. Here's where I have an issue with this question. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna lawyer up here. Yep, do it. Say Love it. That having a Mount Rushmore of broadcasters across the whole space is an unfair exercise because there are so many different sports and mediums and eras. There's like there's regional broadcasters and there's national broadcasters and there's baseball broadcasters and basketball broadcasters and broadcasters that do all the sports. Um so all right, fine. Uh, I'll, 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 for this purpose, I'll, I'll put Mike Breen on there as well. Mm. Um, I love, I love listening to Mike Breen call a basketball game. But like, again, this leaves out Brian Anderson and leaves out Jason Benetti and leaves out Adam Amin and Joe Davis and Joe Buck, who's phenomenal, and Gary Cullen and Howie Rose, who are two of my biggest influences and people that I look up to incredibly. It also leaves out, I mean, Heck, we're, we're talking about Hall of Famers and Teddy Matthews. We're talking about Ryan Lefebvre, who's, I think, a future Hall of Famer. Like, we're, we're leaving out so many tremendous broadcasts across the sport that I, I hate that question so much. <laughs> well, we asked the tough questions here on one yeah, day, and, yeah, and yeah, we, know, figured, know, we figured the guy that, that you, knows you the started off, you, a... you guys just started off throwing haymakers, and I, I don't fault you for yeah. that at all. Like, that's what we're here for. Uh, yeah. It, it, we, if somebody knows the nuances of a press box window, can absolutely put together <laughs> a the condensed oh, list. You know that's, that's fair. That's, that's that's entirely fair. One of the guys that you did leave off the list was our uh, Uncle Hud, Rex Hudler. Um, oh, well, not that's, sure that's, how many... a, that's a separate conversation. It I is, thought we were talking play by play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, okay. that's, and he is in his own category, anyways. I mean, he is a Mount Rushmore. Hud is, Hud is all four spots on yeah. Mount Hud. On Mount Hudler, yes. The, uh, when we first we got to talk a bit a couple of times, and it seemed like when you first met Rex Hudler, you told me a story about um, how y he unknowingly had called many games with you prior to you actually meeting. I wanted you to kind of share that story with uh, with our listeners. Yeah, so I mean, I I'm 28 years old. Uh, I grew up with the uh, the only video game system that I have ever had is a PlayStation 2, uh, which I got in 2006. Uh, I was like, I don't know, 10 or 11 years old. It was a, it was a birthday present. And um, that birthday present with the PS2 came with a couple of games. One of them was NCAA 2006, which for my money is still the best version of that game. That is the best one. hundred percent. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad we can all agree. Uh, mm -hmm. And it also came with MLB 06, the show, which featured Big Poppy on the cover um, and was also a fantastic game. The broadcast crew for MLB 06, the show, was Matt Baskersian, who did the play-by-play. -play. Um, Dave Campbell and Rex Hudler were the two color commentators on the game. And, you know, at that point, it was a little bit more like recorded lines that fit into spots. It was not as fluid and free flowing as the games today. And so you just heard these lines over and over and over again to the point where, like, I played this game so much that I knew every single line that was going to come as it was starting to be said. I don't remember them word for word now, but like when I was a kid, I'd play this game and, like, you know, someone would hit a fly ball somewhere and I'd say whatever the line was right along with Rex Hudler or Matt Fasker or Dave Campbell. And so I told him, I was like, by the way, we like sort of called a game together before you pre-recorded all your stuff and I was just mimicking it. But like I heard your voice throughout my like childhood uh, in a way that, you know, nowadays with, with MLB TV and all those things, like if you're in Seattle, you can watch Marlins baseball and you can have an appreciation for the Marlins broadcast. That didn't exist, you know, in 2006. Um, you know, it was only 
later on, you know, when I got to college, really, that I was able to even tune into Vince Scully calling Dodger games uh, because of MLB TV. There wasn't there wasn't that ability to go find that the way that you can now. But uh, I still had still had HUD in my life. It's awesome. Full circle moment. I, yeah. I just yeah. remember you told me that story. I was like, man, that is one of the <laughs> coolest things ever. Mm-hmm. It's awesome. Man, we're here with Jake Eisenberg, One World Away. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Thanks for listening to KC Sports Network. Make sure you download our new app. Find it on the App Store or Google Play. Just search KC Sports Network. And we're back. Jordan Foote, Josh Kaiser, Joel Penfield, and special guest Jake Eisenberg. Extremely excited about this episode of One Royal Way. Um, We're going to keep it moving here. And this one is probably a little bit easier of a question. Jake has made it through the gauntlet only for... Um, the final gauntlet at the very end. So there are only, two. only barely. Yes, only it, exactly. We are going to sandwich it in between here. Um, open the window, so to speak, to Jake's past. And I guess is present with this world's organization. Um, Jake, when you were in Omaha, you obviously had prior experience looking back on it with a lot of the core of the Royals organization. Now i um, getting to know those stories, getting to know those players. What do you think the added benefit is of kind of having that prior relationship with a lot of the guys that are on the big league club now. I would like to think, or I hope that it's, that it's trust that having gone through that period of their life and career with them, like they saw me do a lot of the same things and grind in a lot of the same ways that now that we're here together, we have a shared foundation of that experience of riding the bus to Des Moines or, flying to Denver so that we could get to Indianapolis for an opening day where it was 37 degrees and rainy uh, in 2022. Like those are shared experiences and watching them develop as players and also like grow as humans. You know, we're also thankfully, luckily, like we're all in a similar age range that the life experiences are somewhat similar. You know, like Nick Prado uh, just got married in November. Vinny Pasquintino just got married in December. I'm getting married next week um you know eventually you know players will start you know starting their families or getting engaged like we're, we're having similar human experiences while we're also experiencing being in the majors uh for the first time together and it is it's it's different don't get me wrong like they're going out there every single day and having to perform at the highest level of the top game and there's a lot of pressure that comes with that that's not to say that there's no pressure on us as a broadcast crew to produce that same top level effort at the top of our game every day, but they are separate disciplines. Um, certainly, but, uh, experiencing those things with them and now being here now with them, I think that there's a level of trust that exists where they know that, you know, I've, I've got their back, you know, and, and I, I hope that's something that they, that they recognize and that they understand that like they can share things with me and give me the ability to tell their story and be the conduit to anybody tuning in. Um, in, in a fair and entertaining way that, that we try to be. Obviously, last year was really tough from a, a win-loss perspective. Did the losses piling up kind of weigh on you at all? Like, How did you stay motivated to still kind of to maintain that positive voice and, and still show up with that same attitude every single day? Because yeah, like, we're obviously in different levels of media. Like You're way up here and we're like way down here. But it got it was tough for us to come on here and record and talk about these things and not be sort of doom and gloom talking about a hundred six loss team. It's not easy. So how did you how did you stay motivated? Yeah, it's a it's a really interesting question uh, and and an interesting thing to experience. And I think it's important. Like I've experienced seasons in the minor leagues where the team that I was working with had the worst record in the division, or you know my 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 first season in the minors with Brooklyn. That team went. 24 and 56 or something. And it was the worst record in franchise history. Now I've been with other teams in the minors that experienced like the height and made the playoffs and were the best team. So like I've seen both sides of that. And I think what's interesting about the 2023 Royals, at least from my perspective is yes, the final record was 56 and 106. It did not feel like that every single day, especially in the second half of the season. To me, the, April and May were really tough because there was all this promise coming off of spring training and then it didn't really start the way anybody expected or wanted to. Injuries piled up, the record piled down. And for me, the low point of the season was when they lost 10 straight games and had that winless road trip in Miami and Baltimore. And it was like, oh, this is not going to be pretty. But again, that was the low point. I think from there, 
it really didn't feel dismal. Like, sure, there was the understanding that, like, okay, this team is not going to win the World Series this year, and barring something relatively miraculous, this team is not going to make the playoffs. That said, when you start turning the page to July, and Cole Reagans shows up, and Alec Marsh starts to take a bigger step forward, and Bobby Wood Jr. ascends to superstardom, and Michael Garcia figures some stuff out and is like, okay, we got a leadoff hitter now. And Michael Massey's statistics start looking like they should instead of basically the the terrible luck that he had for basically the first three months. I mean, he finished the season as literally the unluckiest player in baseball when you take a look at his expected stats and what his actual stats were. So those numbers started to come back to the the mid-range. MJ Melendez had a great second half. And this is just on the offensive side too. And so I think the second half of the season, we saw so much young talent and so much promise that there were things that you could hold on to within each game, whether it was a win or a loss that gave you hope for tomorrow and gave you hope for the next week and the next month and ultimately for the 2024 season. And I mean, the best example that I can give is, I mean, heck, this is a Royals team that, yeah, lost 106 games, but a week before that happened, they swept the Astros at their place. Dominant Batchett. We watched Cole Reagan's dominate. We watched James MacArthur strike out Jordan Alvarez a couple of times and like was absolute nails. We haven't talked nearly enough about how great his September was. The dude didn't give up a run. Didn't give up a run. Like that's yeah. that's insane. And so the 106 losses, it it wasn't all at once. And so it didn't really weigh on me tremendously. Now, that also comes from a place of yeah, it's my first season in Major League Baseball and everything is amazing. Like, I'm just so grateful to be here that whether it's 106 losses or 104 losses or 95 losses, like, yeah. I'm just, I'm happy to be here and I'm, and I'm enjoying experiencing all of this. Um, and to be honest, like, in the grand scheme of things, yes, 106 ties the franchise record. But if you lose 106 and you don't make the playoffs and you lose... 96, you know, like the playoffs, the end result is still the same, except for, you know, draft order and all that stuff. And, you know, but that's, that's tertiary in my, yeah, that's a whole other conversation. (laughs) I will say this, I will say this, and this, this may throw, this may throw a little bit of shade. So I'll, I'll preface it with that. But as far as the, the feeling of the weight of the season, it was not something that I felt. I will say that we went, when we went to Chicago in mid-September, Royals, White Sox, and there was a double header in there. I will say that the the misery there was palpable. Mm-hmm. Like that there was there was a level of expectation for what that team should have been and could have been that absolutely did not get reached and you could feel the angst and disappointment and the weight of how that season had had unfolded on the south side while you were in that ballpark that's the that's the sense that i got and that feeling i i never had about the 2023 royals because there was so much promise in the second half of the season i i mean i feel like we could fill a whole hour on making fun of how bad the white Sox and their current position is (laughs) that just makes me so happy um but you kind of go back to that while you're in the mix of that and you kind of see you're with the team you're you know you and your colleagues are all kind of still inside the the ropes but also kind of still outside too i'm not asking you to throw anybody under the bus or throw shade or anything here but in your opinion what was that team missing and out of all the position or all the acquisitions that they've made in the off season do you feel like they've addressed that adequately to at least start the season well i mean i think what they were missing is pretty obvious it was it was consistency for one um it was pitching for another uh it's really hard to win games if pitching is not a solid foundation. And I don't think that's throwing shade or casting blame on anybody in particular, especially when you look at, I mean, you look at the Royals opening day rotation for 2023, and it was Brady Singer, Zach Granke, Jordan Lyles, Brad Keller, and Chris Bubich. Okay, within the, I mean, you could throw Daniel Lynch in there too. He got hurt right at the end of spring training. Probably would have been him instead of Chris Bubich, but Daniel Lynch is hurt. So, you know, uh, Daniel Lynch is, is out for a couple of months. Then Chris Bubich goes down with Tommy John after three starts. Then Brady Singer is kind of up and down and rocky after the WBC, and uh, he winds up finishing the season on the injured list. Uh, Brad Keller goes on the injured list in mid-May, and that was after some some rocky starts and some control issues here and there. And then you have Jordan Lyles, who had probably of 
the projected season that he could have, he had the first percentile season. Mm-hmm. And that's that's going to happen. Like, you know, he could have very easily had the 99th percentile season, and hopefully that's what happens this year. But he wound up having statistically about as bad of a season as could have been thought out. And as much as we love Zach Greinke, especially toward the latter half of the season, that was sort of true for him too. He was at a different point in his career where it wasn't necessarily dominant or given day in and day out what necessarily you were going to get. And when it comes to the most durable starting pitchers that were on the Royals last year, they were Zach Greinke and Jordan Lyles, who I think if I remember correctly, collectively finished you know, with an ERA somewhere around five and a half, maybe even a little bit yeah. higher than that. Uh, and so when you've got 60 plus starts and that is the foundation, that makes it very difficult, especially with a bullpen that, you know, does blow some leads here or there. The Royals had 50 blown lead losses last year. Some of those leads, sure, are in the first inning and second inning and a result of whoever the starting pitcher is. Some of those blown leads are in the sixth inning. A lot of them are in the sixth inning or the seventh inning or the eighth inning or the ninth inning. And so it's an all-encompassing thing that, look, you've got 50 blown lead losses. Let's think about this for a second. Let's say you cut that number in half and you have 25 games where you had a lead and you kept it, and you add 25 wins to the 56 that were from last season. That's 81 wins. You've all of a sudden become a 500 team, right? Did I do that math correct? Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. correct. Yeah, <laughs> all of a sudden, just like that, 500 team. Mind-boggling. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so what the Royals did, what J.J. Piccolo did, and this staff did, is they went out and they... Got set Ludo, and they got Michael Waka, and they got Chris Stratton, and they traded for Nick Anderson, and that bolsters a rotation. Not to mention that Cole Reagans shows up in the second half as a potential ace, and hopefully he can do for a full season what he did for a half of a season, which was nothing short of look like one of the best pitchers in the American League. And then a bullpen starts to take shape with Will Smith coming in, and hopefully James MacArthur can hold on to what he had in September. Hopefully, Carlos Hernandez can be what he was in the first half of last season as opposed to the second half of last season. Uh, John McMillan threw four innings, but looked pretty great. And maybe, you know, there's still a little bit of unknown there, but you hope that he's the dominant presence that you think he can be. And there are still, you know, some unknowns and there are still some, uh, I don't want to say lottery tickets, but like if it works out, it's going to be really good sort of thing. But there's way more depth in that space than there was a year ago. And I think that that helps raise the floor of this team from what it was last year to a team that like, yes, in the offseason, hope springs eternal and every single team is zero and zero and can go win the World Series. But in an American League Central where not really any other team has done anything of massive significance, it is not out of the question to see the Royals go from a place where they were last year to a place of legitimate contention within their division. So this is the question I've been most excited to ask you since we got this interview nailed down. I think easily the best moment of last season, singular moment, was Bobby Wood Jr.'s walk-off Grand Slam against Yohan Duran. Number one with a bullet, like no doubt about it. Yeah. Your call of that home run was spectacular. I think when you think about how you diagnose like a good call, I think it checks every box. How do you balance letting the moment breathe and like ha- letting the like the crowd noise come in and and just letting everyone kind of think about what they just saw, while also still kind of putting your stamp on that moment. Like, that was a Jake Eisenberg walk-off home run call. Well, for starters, I think it's important to not think of it as a Jake Eisenberg walk-off home run call. That is a Bobby Wood Jr. walk-off grand slam. That is a Royals moment. And I'm simply providing the caption to that moment uh, on the TV broadcast. And it is completely different, radio and TV. You know, there are different schools of thoughts on this. I'll start with radio. You need to let the noise from the crowd and the environment of the ballpark come through on the radio. That said, there's a balance you have to strike because the people listening on the radio can't see what's happening. They can maybe imagine Bobby Wood Jr., you know, jogging around the bases, but they don't see that. And so, you know, on a big moment home run, say, for instance, on the radio, I'll try and describe the guy when he comes around third, giving Vance Wilson a high five or a low five or jumping on home plate or throwing off the helmet, some sort of description there that puts you in that moment because you can't see it. As I'm doing that, I'm talking over the crowd, still cheering. There are schools of thought that will say, 
don't say anything. Just let the crowd tell the story. I'm of the opinion that on the radio, the crowd is incapable of telling the whole story because they're cheering and jubilant. And that gives you the emotion, but it doesn't give you the picture that you need to paint. In my opinion, there is a balance there. TV, that's a lot different because we can see everything. I don't need to tell you what it looks like. I don't even need to tell you what it feels like. I could say absolutely nothing and it would still be an amazing moment. I think where I come in or where any broadcaster comes in is you want to try and capture that moment and elevate that moment. Give space to allow that moment to be digested. Um, and there's there's an art in pulling back on TV that, frankly, I'm still trying to figure out. You know, going from radio to TV is is a difficult transition because you have to figure out what descriptions aren't as necessary and you got to kind of do it in the moment. And for that specific call, I'm glad that I pulled back uh, in the ways that I did. I'll be honest, part of that was because I was left a little speechless at what just happened. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And in that moment, like you learn over time not something that jumps in immediately, then silence from me is going to be better than anything that I try and come up with in that moment. I don't want to fumble through that moment. I don't want to throw something at the wall and hope it sticks. Um, I'll be honest, you know, at that point in time, Bobby Wood Jr.'s season, that that was the start of his rocket ship. Absolutely. Right? Like that game was the start, really. Even though it was the end of July, he had a great month of July and a solid month of June. That moment was his springboard to superstardom in the 2023 season. And so I, this is all in hindsight, but like in that moment, had I said something about his superstardom, it wouldn't have landed, I don't think, because he hadn't captured that quite yet. Now, in hindsight, I wish I had because that would have told the story of his season a lot better. So like that's the push pull in hindsight's always... 2020 but um i think yeah first and foremost it's not it's not my moment ever or is it any broadcaster's moment ever and i think broadcasters that think of it as their moment first as opposed to the team's moment or the player's moment or the fans moment i think that's where some broadcasters get into trouble in trying to put their stamp on something because it's not it's not about me uh it's never it's never about me we're experiencing this together and i'm just trying to capture the emotion elevate the moment and then let us all appreciate the greatness that we just witnessed it's a really good perspective yeah i mean that's something i don't think anybody would have outside of the booth would have appreciated about that that is that's why they pay you the big bucks jake that's what it is <laughs> um something we've talked I'll, about I'll say, which... I'll say i'll say it's just just one more thing i like I, I give a ton of credit on, on the tv side uh specifically like that moment is so much more than just the 12 words that i might say like it's up to Kevin Cedargren to find the right shots. It's up to Steve Kurtenbach to say, okay, we're going to take that shot. We're going to take that shot. And it's up to all those people in the truck to make that moment visually happen for the television audience. It's also in a lot of ways up to HUD to know when it's time to jump in. And like, look, we love HUD. We know HUD. He wants to, to be there in that moment. And for him to have the ability to understand the moment, okay, this is where I need some restraint and Jake and I or Ryan and I or whoever are going to have this unspoken communication. It's not like, okay, now it's time for us to start digesting this. Like I think about this a lot early on, you know, when Hud and I, you know, are still forming our chemistry. I think about the the game against the Angels uh, when Samad Taylor had that walk-off hit over Mike Trout's head and Bobby Wood Jr. ran out to get the baseball. You know, that moment happens. We call the moment. We're pulling back for the crowd. And Hud and I looked at each other and we kind of both nod at the same time. And then he jumps in and he talks about Bobby running out there to get the baseball. And that's one of the parts that makes that moment like that, that it raises the hairs. And so it is it is a massive, massive team undertaking an effort to make something like that stick in everybody's brains in the ways that we hope it does. 100% all about the team. I love it. It's It makes a lot of sense. And something we've talked about before that happened last season that I don't think a lot of fans would have expected, especially when he was brought in, was how much of a positive impact a role does Chapman had on this locker room last year. Um, I don't think anybody would have... That's not on their bingo cards. Nobody ex is expecting that from a role as Chapman from what we had seen from him prior to that. 
but it, it was kind of cool to to hear you talk about his influence on that locker room with you being in there was there any other you know opportunities or players or coaches that really made a positive impact that really stood out to you that that us on the outside wouldn't have seen well first you know with respect to Aroldis his impact on the 2023 Royals doesn't remove or excuse anything that happened before the 2023 Royals and those are not waters that I'm going to wade into because they're not waters that I'm that that they're not my waters to, to swim in um but he did he did come into the Royals clubhouse and you know his relationship with Salby is really strong they work out together in the offseason I'm sure you guys have seen the videos on Instagram mm. uh, at this point but he had a pretty strong impact on Carlos Hernandez and helping him figure out you know how to be an everyday back of the bullpen reliever and, and many other guys too and you know if you're a young reliever how could you not look at the guy who has literally dominated that space since he arrived with the Reds seven time All Star like you know, throwing 105.4 miles an hour, whatever it is, and not be like, okay, this guy has something figured out. How do I get there too? But it's also, it's also Chapman's willingness to be malleable with the Royals coaching staff and Brian Sweeney and Mitch Stetter and everybody else and Zach Bowe and say, okay, here's some mechanical issues that I have. I need to fix these and be open to fixing them to a point where he rediscovers who he is in a way that makes him the the trade chip that he is and ultimately look the rangers won a world series that's a great trade no matter what anybody says that's great for everybody involved the royals got an ace the rangers got a world series their first in franchise history everyone's doing that 10 out of 10 times uh for the rest of everyone's days um as far as anybody else uh, in the clubhouse um i think it was a clubhouse that um like it wasn't hard to look around and be like, oh, there are only a handful of guys in here that have more than five years of major league service time. Um, you know, so there's a lot of I, I really I really don't like the phrase young kids. Uh, and that got thrown around a lot last year. Like, yes, young in terms of major league experience, um, but not in terms of life experience relative to the rest of the league. And also, like, it became sort of a it became sort of an excuse, I think, like, oh, these young kids are learning. It's like, okay, no, like, we're, like, a lot of them have been here. Like, this is either year two or year one or, like, you know, and I think they would say the same thing, which is why I'm I'm saying it now. Um, hmm. But I think that there were places where that veteran leadership that existed really came into play. I mean, I think one of the unsung heroes of 2023 was Matt Duffy. I think he had a massive impact on Bobby Wood Jr. and Michael Massey and Vinny Pasquantino and the you know Royals infielders writ large um, and outfielders too, but I think he was a really big piece of that clubhouse in showing those guys how to go about their business every single day. And he was somebody that they could go to lean on for you know various questions about preparation or, or what have you. And like his placement within that clubhouse, you know, his locker being where it was with you know, Bobby and Vinny and, and over there in that space. I think that's, I think that's intentional. It's like, I think he wasn't on the field a ton. Like he was on the team the entire time. Um, but I think his clubhouse presence was very underrated. And I think honestly, that's, that's partially on us as a broadcast crew. I don't know that we told that story very effectively last year. Um, and I would say similarly in that vein, I, I think about Nick Whitgren and I think about Taylor Clark. Um, as two other guys who occupied that sort of space. And and that was a space that, that I witnessed in the clubhouse and on the field. And I don't know that we told that story um, as well as we could have. That's awesome. And yeah. um, lot, lots of influence. Uh, we're going to jump ahead, I guess, to the final gauntlet, the somewhat lightning round. Uh, Jake's been very gracious with his time here. I, I was watching, I think it was the homestand interview, and you talked about Chase Field and your experience with the Mets where you were like, you're welcome to the big league moment. Um, I could see like you painted a perfect picture of running around and then getting redirected and then, oh my God, this game's going to continue running back up. Um, have you had anything remotely close, like a close call or another welcome to the big league moment where it just kind of hit you? Have you had anything that resembles that whatsoever? Thankfully, no. Uh, I, I say, <laughs> I say, terrifying. I say, no, no, no. I say, thankfully, no, because 
uh, as soon as that happened in Chase Field, like I made a point with every new ballpark I went yeah. to to understand how to get from point A to point B so that I would never get lost like that again. So thankfully, um, I haven't I haven't gotten lost at the wrong time again. Good. I have certainly gotten lost in new <laughs> ballparks, but I've always made sure that happens hours before the game. Uh, so and not you know during the game or, or close to first pitch or something like that. Um, as far as like welcome to the big leagues moments, um, I mean, there are certain experiences that you understand that you might have, and you can prepare for emotionally or you know physically to the best of your ability, and then they kind of happen, and you have to figure it out um, on the fly. Some of them are lighthearted, some of them are heavy. Um, you know, like. I opening day last year was was pretty overwhelming for me emotionally. It was my first major league opening day and seeing everybody lined up uh, on the foul lines and then like Denny's to my right and Stu's like and we're all there like that was pretty overwhelming and you've got to get it all together. And then like I'm in the position there where I'm I'm opening our broadcast before I toss to Denny for the play by play in the top of the first. And yes, we have a pregame show that precedes that. But I understand there are a lot of people that. Um, I, I I hope everybody listens to our pregame coverage because it's fantastic. But I'm sure there are some people that join us, you know, as the game is beginning. And I recognize the weight of the responsibility of basically welcoming everybody to the 2023 season, um, whether they had joined us in spring training or for the pregame coverage or what have you. Like that's the moment where the 2023 season begins, and my voice and my words are the first ones that a lot of people are hearing, and so it sets a tone. And so the weight of that. Uh, was not lost on me. And that was a really special and cool thing. Uh, and in that vein, you know, the first time that we traveled on the road and I led the broadcast and I was the lead broadcaster um, for the first time when we were in San Francisco. Um, those are all kind of big things that that happen along the way that, that kind of stayed into the background over time, but like are things that happened. Um, I think about the first television broadcast that, that I did, not the ones in spring training, the series against the Oakland A's uh, in the very beginning of May. And so many different things swirling around that weekend. The the nervous energy of that Friday game and like, okay, we're doing this on TV for real for the first time. And then the Saturday game with the Lorenzo Cain retirement ceremony and all the different things that went into that. And Low Cain coming and joining us in, in the booth, which was awesome, but definitely not a normal broadcast like sure, you know, sequence from that space and, and navigating, okay. You know, we're talking to Locaine and we're focused on Locaine, but there's also a game going on over here and I'm looking over here, but then there's stuff happening over here and I've got someone in my ear and like juggling all those different things. Like I kind of had to learn how to do as we were doing it. Um, and then one of the more heavier things, you know, the very next day, that's when Ryan Yarborough takes a line drive to the face. Mm -hmm. And how do you handle that moment on the air? Um, and thankfully, you know, Kevin Cedargren is phenomenal and was kind of like, coaching me almost in my ear saying okay you know this is kind of how we need to cover this tonally this is what we're going to do here this is where we're going next and he really guided me through that moment you know had I been you know without the parachute of our truck I, I'm confident that it would have been fine like I'm not really worried about that but it still was a pretty overwhelming thing to try and figure out how to balance the empathy and the fear and all that and also like we're, we've got a broadcast going on and there's another half of this game that's getting played and um, those are just things you know early on in the season but I think about all those moments I think about you know the first walk-off that I call um, whether it's on TV or on the radio um, you know Samad Taylor Bobby Wood Jr. the big milestone moments for Bobby going um, first 2020 and then 3030 and having the calls for those moments in both mediums and it, admittedly the radio aspect of it, um, that feels more natural to me because that's the area that I come from. The TV aspect of it, that was definitely a constant work in progress and will continue to be as the 2024 season unfolds and as you know my career unfolds. So I think there are multiple welcome to the big leagues moments um, over the course of last season, some big, some small, some in between. Um, and I think really you can, you can boil it down to just, as opposed to, you know, welcome to the big leagues. I think it's just new experiences and yeah. learning how to navigate them and then excel at them to the best of your ability. 
I, I'm going to double dip here. I've been wanting to ask this question. Josh, like we, we had a list of fun, goofy questions and some of these are more serious. This one completely goofy, completely unserious, completely um, don't expect a serious. I'm ready for it. I'm ready for Who it. Who wins? So you have a Mets background. Does Mr. Met or Slugger win in a street fight? Do you have a pick there? What are the odds? You know, I mean, our DraftKings might have something set up for that. Mr. Met, Mr. Met is a baseball. Like Slugger is a, a lion. I, that doesn't seem. <laughs> that's not a. That's not a fair fight. You ever see a dog go after a chew toy? Like that's basically what we're talking about here. Uh, I look. I love Mr. Met. Man, a chance. It's not even. It's <laughs> not even. This, the, this is an un, What? Not even the what? What is Mister Men bringing to this fight? The New York dog in him. He's got that dog in him. He's like, I'm walking here. Please, all bark, no bite. <laughs> Mister Met doesn't stand a chance in a mascot yeah. brawl with Slugger. I mean, we can we can devolve this and be like, okay, well, who's the most fearsome mascot in all of baseball? Mm-hmm. Frankly, like Slugger. Slugger's I top think, much. I think Slugger, Slugger could stand his ground, I think, against most other mascots. It, I mean, when you've got three R's at the end of your name, you're back. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's got to be the Philly Fanatic is the odds on favor because they're just the wild card factor. Yeah. You do not know what is they are going to pull out and do. There's a lot of, like, he's throwing some weight around, too. Yeah. He's got some thrusting. He's got the whole ATV. Like, yeah, the Fanatic, uh, I don't know that I don't know that I'd want to see the Fanatic in the ring. Mm. All right, let's go back to a little baseball history is my thing. So this is where I'm going to take this. If you had, to, if you could go back and call one historic moment in baseball history, you're the one that is setting the stage for it. What what play is it? That's such a historic job. moment. Good job, Joel. In baseball history that I could have the call for. Um. I think of I think of I'll, I'll give you four that come to mind um, and they all kind of have a similar theme I think of Joe Carter's walk off Homer to oh, win the world I mean as, as far as as far as as far as singular plays by uh, championship probability added like if you sort it on baseball or whatever that is the number one play in baseball history. That's number one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So like that comes to mind. I mean, Bill Mazurowski did the same thing with the Pirates in the 60s. Mm-hmm. So you can kind of throw that one in there, too, as part of that. Um, Kirk Gibson's homer in game one of 1988. Uh, playoff walk-off yeah, homers in like, general. Yeah. Like, that's 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 a theme here. But I also mm-hmm. think about a, a couple of iconic plays. Like, I think about Willie Mays' catch in 1954. Uh, I think about Jackie Robinson stealing home. Um, Babe Ruth's called shot would be so freaking cool. Yeah. Um, to call. And then I mean in the more in the more modern space, uh I mean Barry Bonds breaking the home run record. Uh that's huge. Uh Hank Aaron, seven fifteen, huge. Um, I mean, yeah, like if you can go back and call one moment, you think about the iconic moments in baseball history, I think. Um, and those are ones that, that pop into my mind first and foremost, not as much. And I hope you don't take this the wrong way. I don't think of it as much as like, oh, I wish I was on the call in 69 when the Mets won the World Series or 85 when the Royals won or 86 when the Mets won or 2015 when the Royals won because I am abundantly hopeful and optimistic that like at some point I'll I'll get to make that call. I'll mm. get to have that experience. Uh, heck, maybe in 2024. Um and so for me it's for me it's about for me it's about moments, um specific plays rather than uh putting the bow on a season like that. If that makes sense. Is there yeah, somewhere in your Google Drive or in a notebook somewhere like the rough draft of if the Royals no. win the World Series, <laughs> this is what I'm going to say. Definitely not. And that, that kind of goes back to, to one of your earlier questions about, you know, what is a, a Jake Eisenberg walk on? Right. Well, I'm, fair, glad, yeah. I'm, I'm glad that there's no definition. To that. I hope that there's no, no definition of that. I'm sure that, you know, subconsciously I inflect in similar ways or emote in mm-hmm. similar ways, but I'm glad that I don't have a phrase that is a bit of a, of a stamp. And I certainly don't want there to be something that's 
written or coined or whatever. Um, I'll admit, you know, as the game is going on or as moments are starting to unfold or look like they can unfold, sometimes some turn of phrase will pop into my head and I'll try and file that away. <clears throat> um, or maybe like I'll scribble something down at one point that usually, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, it's going, um, taking the moneymaker away. Then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then usually, usually, you know, cross that out, uh, somewhere along the way. But, um, no, there is no, there is no existing, uh, rhyme for when the world, <laughs> when the world series, what I, what I might say, although I do hope that as that moment is unfolding, as we're leading up to that moment, that something that adequately captures it starts to creep in and starts to form. And so we can give that moment um, the gravitas and staying power that it deserves. I, I don't think I can pass this interview up without talking about specific moments that you happen to have missed. And there happen to be actually the objectively the greatest baseball moments of all time that you completely left off the list. And, I'm, I'm talking about what, 50 cents tell me. ceremonial first pitch. <laughs> okay, that's pretty good. Yep, that's also very good. I'm talking about Hosmer's dash home in game five of the 2015 World Series. I'm talking about yeah. Alex yeah. Gordon tying up game one of the 2015 no, you're, World you're Series. Right. Daniel Murphy's error in the 2015 World Series where the Royals beat, um, who'd they beat, Jake? Alcides Escobar is inside the park home run to start Very the whole good. thing. Oh, man. Christian Colon's yeah. RBI single in, in all of the, all of those things. All yeah, those I mean, I've, those are. I, I couldn't help I've but gone notice back, I've gone back. And, I've gone back and listened. I've gone back and listened <laughs> to those broadcasts, and uh, they were captured incredibly well. Yeah, um, those were not omitted purposefully. Those were omitted out of a recency <laughs> bias. Uh -huh, uh, sure, and you know, trying to appreciate the historical nature of the question, I opted to think more in black and white than in you know vivid color of the 21st century. A likely story, you know. We'll yeah, yeah, yeah. By that. <laughs> no problem. No problem there. I, I just have one more question for you, and it's a math question. We've done a little math today. You can you can help me out with this, but have what? Which amount is greater? Okay, which which amount? Of, okay. The amount of poop in George. Brett's pants in the Crab League's Las Vegas story or the amount of pee in Matt Harvey's cleats in Game 5 fought top and nine uh, of that 2015 World Series where the Royals became world champions over the New York Mets. Which which one was the most? Hey, I, I got to give it to King George here. Uh, <laughs> we, we've, heard, we've heard the story uh, in the lobby of the Bellagio and the yeah. howls that were involved, this howls, all these things. And if you, if you haven't had the chance, I'm sure you guys have seen the the George Brett documentary uh, on MLB Network. It was phenomenal. They did a, yeah. really such a great job with that. Um, you know, I was at the screening that they had over at Union Station. And um, look, I'm going to date a few people here with what I'm about to say. But like when George Brett retired, I had not yet been born. So I never saw George Brett play mm. i have no conscious capacity of what that looked like what that felt like anything mm -hmm. um however this documentary gave me somebody of, of my generation that never had that experience gave me a better understanding and better appreciation of what he was as a player who he is as a person and what he means to this city that I had previously. And that is, I, I think, about as big of a praise as, as I can give in my position um, for that documentary. So to answer your question, Josh, yeah, I'll give it I'll give it to George. Uh, I don't know that Matt Harvey was really quaking in his boots there. Like, he's the one who wanted to go out, you know, and keep throwing <laughs> in that game. And so he had all the confidence in the world. Um, yeah. You know, I don't, I don't think that he had, you know, such ill-adverse uh, urinary effects uh, mm -hmm. as George did uh, with his, with his, Painting his dalliance with crap. One of those went out on his shield, and the other one just went out. <laughs> I uh, that's a good way to say it. <laughs> I can't. See, think I got a better. I know exactly I literally... what you're going through with your calls. Like they're just somewhere in there, just hoping they're going to yeah. flow out yeah. at some point. I I did my best to let the emotion in, capture the moment. Um, I don't have any commentary for that to add. So um, <laughs> I'm doing my best, Jake Eisenberg impression. I couldn't do it, but. Um, Jake Iceberg himself, man. Thank you so much for uh, coming on. We really appreciate your time, man. 
Yeah, thank thanks for having me. I'm I'm glad that uh, that we found some time to do this. I'm looking forward. Look, we're like a month from spring training. I'm mm-hmm. so excited to get down to Arizona and see the green grass instead of snow and cacti and baseballs <laughs> instead of ice and honestly just like get this get the season started i'm really excited for um, what i think is going to be a really special and exciting uh year two for me in the booth uh year two for some of the players year three four whatever for a lot of them but um i think that this this chapter of of royals baseball is going to be one that uh, is going to be really really fun to, to follow along with and be a part of it's going to be a blast. You guys can listen to Jake all season long. It's going to be great. Spring training is going to be back before we know it. So will we. But until then, we'll talk at you next time.